Now, this is a judgment-free zone. If you imagined yourself doing that particular experience, how many of you think that maybe you would have gone through eating the whole meal before you remembered you were doing this experience of your senses? How many of you think you might have fallen off the exercise at some point or another and began to think about something else or have some preconception about the meal or whatever? Yeah, okay. No judgment. No judgment. So try this sometime, maybe even this week. No one else needs to know that you're trying it and see what your actual experience is. This particular exercise in our reading, as you know, comes from the work of a Buddhist teacher, B. Alan Wallace. He's been an active participant in some extended retreats with the Dalai Lama uh, and some global dialogues between Buddhists and scientists. In his book, The Attention Revolution, Unlocking the Power of the Focused Mind, he presents a centuries-old tradition of training the attention through specific meditation practices and experiential approaches like the one that Helen described for us. Indeed, cultivating attentional stability has been a core element of meditative and contemplative traditions throughout the centuries. Wallace recognizes that we are in dire need of this kind of training today more than ever. He states that Few things affect our lives more than our faculty of attention. And for many of us today, our attention is impaired most of the time. Social scientists and others have elaborated on Wallace's proposition and give some specifics of this attention crisis and the implications it has on our personal and social, uh, and our social collective lives. Now, before I proceed, I want to make a distinction between what I'm talking about here as our attention crisis and attention deficit disorder, ADHD. There has indeed been a soaring of ADHD diagnoses in children and youth by some estimates of 43% or more since 2003. The number of children being given stimulants to address this has doubled from 1998 to 2004. The market for prescribed stimulants is now worth at least $10 billion. And it is estimated that the United States manufactures and consumes five times more of such drugs than the rest of the world combined. There's general agreement, and I want to underline this, among scientists that ADHD is a real problem and that children, youth, and adults are not making it up and are not faking it. There is agreement that there can be a biological contribution to this condition with some controversy on how much is biological. And there are various understandings of the causes and the treatment of ADHD. But again, I am not reflecting this morning on ADHD. Instead, I am focusing on the general attention crisis in our society. Is that clear? Okay. Why this attention crisis is important, some of its causes, some of the avenues that are available to us in addressing it. We face a crisis in attention that has been described in various ways. Here is some of the evidence that is used. The average American college student tends to switch task every 65 seconds. The average adult working in an office stays on one task for three minutes. The important detail here is that some research show, shows, Michael Posner at the University of Oregon, who found that when you're focusing on something and you get interrupted, it could take on the average 23 minutes for you to get back to the same level or state of focus. Think about that for a second. That's a big cost to pay for distraction. Now, obviously, another source of our distracted attention is our smartphone. 
anyone looking at their smartphone right now, it's a non-judgment atmosphere. The average amount of time spent daily on a phone, not counting talking on the phone, has increased in recent years, and no surprise, of course, reaching a total of four hours and 30 minutes as of April 2022. This figure is expected to reach around four hours and 39 minutes by 2024. Think about it. Think about what a significant function, fraction, I'm sorry, of our waking hours that four hours or so is. Think about how else that time could be utilized. Now, it's estimated that the amount of sustained attention that any one of us can give to a particular topic has also decreased over time. Now, why do I even bring this up? Why do I even bring up this whole crisis of attention? I'll tell you. I believe it's important. It's important to give some of our attention to attention, so to speak, because we will soon recognize, if we don't already, that this attention crisis impacts all of us in varying degrees individually, but impacts all of us in society as well. Here's one reason it's important, I believe, to bring it up. In his description of the bare attention exercise, Alan Wallace makes the point that just as a meal can pass by unnoticed, so can the rest of our lives. He explains that often we're not able to take what he calls the fresh produce of the world straight from the fields of the senses without prepackaging raw experiences with our own imposed preconception and habitual conceptual wrappings. We become distant from our actual experiences while we're actually having those experiences. It could be that in eating and in life, we race ahead, ignoring our full sense experience, and we get absorbed in our thoughts, our preconceptions, our distractions, so that the full experience of the meal or of life itself slips by. I resonate so much with that very familiar quote from Henry David Thoreau, uh, and I suspect there are others here that do as well. Any of us who've experienced the loss of a loved one in our life, who have a keen sense of our own mortality, for whatever reason, may resonate with this declaration of Thoreau. I wish to live deliberately to front only essential the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to teach and not when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. I wanted to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life. For me, this declaration resonates so much with my understanding of the Unitarian Universalist way. We want to focus on this life. We want to live with intention and direction. We aim to take personal responsibility and also to claim to, to uh, care for the common good. We aim to recognize and to awaken to not just to our own fragility, but also to our dear and precious interconnectedness with all of life, what we call the interdependence, the interdependent web of all existence, to savor with intention each morsel of life, to stay with that eating metaphor for just a moment longer. However, To let life's moments slip by, to be asleep at the wheel, so to speak, seems contrary to the kind of personally awakened and socially responsible lives that we aim for in this religious path that we call Unitarian Universalists. Yet, being asleep at the wheel, 
being in a trance and being constantly distracted and even overwhelmed by all that's coming to us at once seems to be the fate of many of us today. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. But now I want you to imagine that I'm waving some big red flags. Do you see them? Do I have your attention? Okay, great. When we are, when we slip in and out of this somnambulant state to find ourselves so unfocused that our best intentions and highest ideals seem to slip us by, our tendency is to deride ourselves and to blame ourselves alone. I'm here to tell you this morning that what we are struggling with is bigger than our own individual patterns. We are dealing with a situation that's bigger and broader than our own making. And this crisis of attention will require some individual strategies as well as some social ones to address it. We need to have a deeper analysis than one that would have us just feel personally inadequate or guilty. And then consequently, we might just dive back into our useless attempts to pay attention or to become less distracted. Johan Hari's book, Stolen Focus, has been a resource that I found most useful in broadening my own understanding of this attention crisis in a more comprehensive way. Hari alerts us to the reasons why attending to this attention crisis is important and provides, through his interviews with experts from around the world of various fields, some of the sources of this contemporary crisis. So why is this important? Well, let's build our understanding. Harry goes on to explain, when you are unable to pay attention, you can't achieve the things you want to achieve, he says. You want to read a book, but you're pulled away by pings and paranoias of social media. You want to spend a few uninterrupted hours with your child, but you keep anxiously checking your email to see if your boss is emailing you. Your life dissolves instead into a blur of Facebook posts that only make you feel envious or anxious. Through no fault of your own, there never seems to be enough stillness, enough cool, clear space for you to stop and think. Now, if you found yourself kind of slumping in your seat or diverting your eyes in shame as I read this last paragraph, don't. Remember, it's a non-judgmental space. You are not alone. And it's not your fault alone. So let's collectively sit up, and I mean literally sit up, and face head on the broader reasons that this is important, the sources of the attention crisis, and let's look for some strategies. Are you ready? Okay. This attention crisis goes beyond just a personal one, as I'm indicating. It's a social one. Hari goes on to spell out why we need to confront this as a society as well. As a species, we are facing a slew of unprecedented tripwires and trapdoors, like the climate crisis. And unlike previous generations, we are mostly not rising to solve our biggest challenges. Why? Well, part of the reason, he asserts, is that when attention breaks down, problem solving breaks down. Solving big problems requires sustained focus of many people over many years. And that sustained attention is what seems to be eroding in many corners of our society. And there's another reason this attention crisis is important for us to face now. Harry points out that democracy requires the ability of a population to pay attention long enough to identify real problems, distinguish them from fantasies, come up with solutions, and hold their leaders accountable if they fail to deliver. If we lose the capacity to pay attention in these ways, 
we lose our ability to have a fully functioning society. Now, on this third anniversary of the January 6th attempted coup in the United States, I believe this reason for paying attention to what is happening to our attention is critical. As Harry asserts, I don't think it's a coincidence that this crisis in paying attention has taken place at the same time as the worst crisis of democracy since the 1930s. People who can't focus will be more drawn to simplistic authoritarian solutions and less likely to see clearly when these authoritarian solutions fail. Maybe I have your attention now? Yes? No? Okay. So one metaphor an expert uses that if we're driving a car and someone throws a bucket of mud on the windshield, uh, before proceeding, we need to get that mud off the windshield. Likewise, given the kind of problems that require us to have sustained attention right now, we need to clear up our attention problems first. So these are just some of the reasons why we uh, need to pay attention to, pay, to paying attention. It allows us to be spiritually alive. It allows us to live more fully and deliberately. It allows us to be able to focus on the big problems that we are facing right now, to be alert to the forces that distract and manipulate our attention while authoritarianism and democracy are in tension. So how did this problem in paying attention come about? There's a convergence of many factors you can imagine that contribute to this and can also help us understand that we would, what we would need to address. More and more, we're coming to understand that there's a built-in setup to grab our attention and our social media that draws us in that keeps us in the process of infinite scrolling. Since the longer we are on social media, the more we can be tracked for targeted ads and messages, and the longer we are available to click on those ads. Information about our clicking and scrolling habits become a commodity that is sold. Now, don't get me wrong. I am talking about social media as a useful tool, but I also want us to be aware of some of the worst parts of social media as well. Harvard Business School professor Shoshana Zuboff's book, Surveillance Capital The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, points out that oftentimes in these social media platforms, we are, our information, our behaviors are being sold as commodities to business customers with a commercial interest in knowing what we do now, soon, and in the future. We have to recognize the benefits of social media in connections and in information and in creating community, but we also have to support the efforts of those who are advocating and demanding that technologies work for us and not against us. Technologies that can feed our ability to focus instead of fracturing it. And it just so happens these capacities are there. We just have not demanded them. From, the, from these platforms. The social commentator and writer Naomi Klein explains what she calls, I love this, the Screen New Deal. She says it was already emerging in our culture and it accelerated with the COVID-19 crisis at a much rapid place, pace and pervasiveness than could have ever been predicted. We were already skidding towards the future Klein explains, we were on a gradual slide into a world in which every one of our relationships was mediated by platforms and screens, and because of COVID, that gradual process went into hyperspeed. Klein continues, we had to adapt quicker than we could really have anticipated. 
and we're still dealing with the consequences of that. We didn't go at the right play, pace, and we're still trying to balance social connections with virtual connections. Klein says, under COVID, even more than before, we were living in simulations of social life, not the real thing. It was better than nothing, to be sure, but it felt thinner. And all the while, the algorithms of surveillance capitalism were altering us, tracking and changing us for many more hours a day. I feel like I should change my voice there and make it sound really scary. So I'll do that. And all the while, the algorithms of surveillance capitalism were altering us, tracking and changing us for many more hours a day. You get the point. Okay. Fortunately, we have a more comprehensive understanding of what contributes to the straining and the draining of our attention. If we have that kind of understanding, we can develop strategies that are comprehensive as well. So I'm going to draw from some of Harry's research uh, as I offer these uh, ways for us to respond. So um, we can do the opposite of what contributes to the straining and straining of our attention. Instead of being severely underslept and overworked, we can attend to our sleep, which has a big impact on our capacity to pay attention. Uh, rather than switch tasks every three minutes, we can commit to practicing sustained attention for a period of time on a project. Set a timer if you need to. Rather than just simply being tracked and monitored by social media sites that are designed to figure out our weaknesses and manipulate them to make us scroll and scroll and scroll, perhaps we can set a timer for how much time we spend there too and interrupt ourselves when we catch ourselves into scrolling and that doom scrolling as well. We can sense what's happening to us and interrupt ourselves in the moment. Rather than allowing ourselves to get so stressed out that we become hypervigilant, we can find ways of attending and managing our stress. Rather than eating diets that cause our energy to spike and crash, we can start attending to our diet. No one knew we were going to have such practical guidelines today, did you? So what else could we do? Well, I'm going to draw again from some of the suggestions in, um, in Harry's book. Pass them on to you. Use pre-commitment more, more to help assuage that switching from one task to another so much. For example, you may decide to not use your phone for two hours before going to bed or allowing yourself to only check emails three times a day. Instead of scolding yourself when you've distracted from the task at hand, maybe cultivate a flow state in yourself intentionally by asking yourself, what could be something meaningful to me that I could do right now? Let's practice that sentence. What is something meaningful I could do to me Meaningful to me that I could do right now. I'm listening. To me that I could do right now. If we find ourselves again distracted and whatever, we can ask ourselves, what's at the edge of my own abilities? And what can I do that gets me to that edge and that's meaningful to me instead of falling into the lure of distraction? Since social media is designed to hack our attention and set up, some set up some designated times when you're totally off of it. Now, I made so sure that our defibrillator batteries were recharged before I made this suggestion, in case anyone had a strong reaction to it. Just breathe with me now. Find times in the day when you can let your mind wander and wander. Take a walk without your phone or another distraction. 
Give your attention some space to roam. Just as children need unstructured time for play, hopefully away from screens, preferably outdoors, so do adults need that break time. Read. Our constant being on screens has changed our patterns of reading, and we, we move through things quickly. And I suggest recognize that um, you might read a book with others and keep a journal by your side and keep your notes and your reflections as you're reading rather than trying to get through it so quickly. Savor and linger with the pages. Get together with others for real conversations. Do art or music. Learn to meditate. Get some sleep. Not now, but when you're home. <laughs> so we're in a time when there's a lot of bickering around who's woke and who isn't woke and how woke we should be, or even if being woke is a, is a goal. We even have a presidential candidate who prides himself in creating a state that he calls anti-woke. Well, I want to step outside of the fray for a moment and take that wide horizons, grander view as I stand alongside of you this morning and I say, I think it's our personal, our spiritual, and our collective and ethical challenge to keep awakening. Keep awakening. This means that we have to be vigilant and not succumbing to the forces around us and within us that would dull our senses and our sensibilities, that would lure us into a drone zone or distract us from our own responsibilities in shaping what unfolds in our lives or in our communities. Let us work together in various ways to keep awakening. Let's show up for times of worship to humble ourselves before our highest ideals, ideals and recognize that ours is what is ours to do individually and collectively? Let's nurture our spirits through music and art and silence and song, connection and conversation. Let us engage in practices of meditation and walking in nature, reading together and honing those practices within our community that can counteract the erosion of attention. Let us be known in this greater community of Wilmington as a place where conversations that matter, matter. Where practices that sustain us happen. Where people engage in making a difference even among problems that can seem insurmountable. And where people do what they can do to address hunger, environmental issues, and health issues. And they do them at a scale that's manageable that we can address them. Now, I'm personally not interested in just talking with you about all of this unless I can see us demonstrating this in our life together. And in fact, as a matter of fact, we're doing it. That whole list that I just went through, I realize that we're doing a lot of that. As you look at our life stream brochure and the opportunities that, uh, that are happening through various members of our congregation, we are creating those opportunities for connection and for community. Not only for ourselves, but for our wider community. Jerry, I think today, stand up for a moment, you're going to be standing at a table in the parish hall and helping people register for any one of those opportunities for connection and community and conversation, the live stream for sure. You can register on the spot. Thank you, Jerry. So, let's keep awakening. Let's manage the forces that would otherwise drain our attention and separate us rather than connect us again and again with what really matters and with each other. Amen.